This video was made possible by CuriosityStream. Sign up for the CuriosityStream Nebula Bundle deal to watch an extended version of this video by going to curiositystream.com slash H-A-I. Okay, so back in the 1970s, when Disco was king, Nixon was queen, and Elvis was their inbred prince son, the Dirty Reds tricked the pure, hardworking Americans into thinking the Russians were spending 60 million rubles a year on, quote, psychotronic research. And while it turns out they were probably punking us, we nonetheless decided to show those communists the brilliance of capitalism by spending $20 million of public money training psychics to help the military. This was the birth of the Stargate Project. Now, this is just one chapter in the history of very real experiments into very not real psychic phenomena. There's the Gansfield experiments, dream telepathy research dating back to Freud, even experiments supposedly proving precognition by Daryl Bam as recently as 2011. Instead of talking about those multiple other interesting things, let's talk about one half as interesting thing. Stargate's earliest and most foundational experiment, conducted with CIA funding in 1972 at the Stanford Research Institute by Dr. Harold Puthoff and not a doctor, Russell Targ. The experiment went like this. Step one, find a person. Any person, actually. Part of Targ and Puthoff's theory is that anyone can express psychic ability. But the person does have to be willing to do a bunch of experiments to see if they are, in fact, psychic, so maybe do the recruiting at a Renaissance fair or something. Step two, come up with a list of 12 distinct locations. Do not tell the maybe psychic person about them. Step three, put the maybe psychic person in a room with an experimenter. Step four, without telling either of the people in the room, have another experimenter choose one of the 12 places and then drive there along with one to three observers. Step five, once at the site, have the observers walk around and look at stuff acting as quote, psychic beacons, whatever that means. Step six, simultaneously have the maybe psychic person describe and draw pictures of what the observers are seeing, despite not knowing where they are. Record this. Step seven, take the maybe psychic to the site so they can see how they did, but do not record this. Step eight, repeat steps one through seven nine times with different locations, doing a few a day. Step nine, get an objective judge, take them to all nine of the locations, and give them the nine unedited transcripts of the maybe psychic person's attempts at descriptions. Step 10, have the judge attempt to match up the transcripts to the locations. Step 11, analyze the data. If the objective judge successfully matched the locations to the transcripts, which again, contained only the conversation between the maybe psychic person and the experimenter, both trapped in a room and not told where the observers were, then the maybe psychic person must have accurately read the psychic beacons of the observers, they can be upgraded from a maybe psychic person to a psychic psychic person, and all of our understanding of the world needs to be reconsidered. Going in with one in nine odds if picking randomly, the six judges in Targ and Puthoff's experiment matched 24 of 45 right. The odds of that happening randomly are less than one in a billion. So the study was published in esteemed scientific journal Nature, and in conclusion, psychics are real. End of video. Thanks for watching. Now let me tell you about our sponsor, Craig. Craig is a guy I met on the street corner, and he sells powder that smells great. Wait, uh, what's that? Oh no. It's the Kiwis. They found us, and they're here to ruin everything. Specifically here to ruin everything are David F. Marks and Richard Kamen two New Zealand researchers who recreated Targ and Puthoff's experiments as exactly as they could. But when it came time for the judges to do the judging thing, it went terribly. Despite the subjects being convinced they had experienced incredible psychic visions, not a single judge correctly matched a single one of their descriptions to a location. Which raised the question, what? Well, while the answer is complicated, the answer is also pretty not complicated. In Mark and Kamen's experiments, before they gave the transcripts to the judges, they edited out certain non psychic -y lines that might have provided unfair clues about how to match them up. The original experiments did not that. Take, for example, this sentence that was left in an original experiment transcript. Quote, I've been trying to picture it in my mind and where you went yesterday on the nature walk. Now, this gives the judge two key pieces of information. First, this transcript does not correspond to the nature walk location. Second, this transcript does correspond to a place that was visited the day after the nature walk. The transcripts were full of information about things that happened on previous days. Plus, it turned out that while the order of the transcripts was randomized in the original experiments, the list of locations was given to the judges in the order in which they were visited. That means if the judge could just order the transcripts chronologically, they could match them. 
basically, the judging was less psychic evaluation and more like one of those little logic puzzles you did in middle school when your teacher had a hangover. Mark and Kamen also found six subtler types of clues that could help judges order chronologically. First, subjects would typically express more confidence in their abilities over time. Second, names of observers were mentioned, but observers changed across days of experimentation. Thus, if only, say, three transcripts mentioned Marty, they're probably all from the same day, the day Marty was there. Third, time of day was often mentioned. Fourth, only some transcripts had drawings, and they tended to be grouped in later sessions. Fifth, descriptions of how the site was selected became more sophisticated over time. And sixth, transcripts generally got shorter over time. Plus, in a blunder that ranks alongside this wooden horse rocks, I bet there's nothing inside it, it seems like some of the original transcripts given to judges may have listed the dates they were recorded. To test their queuing hypothesis, David Marks was given a set of transcripts from the original experiments and a list of locations, but he was not permitted to visit them. Despite not knowing what any of the places looked like, he matched all the transcripts perfectly to the locations based only on the cues, a feat then successfully repeated by multiple other judges. In the end, while the Targ Puthoff experiment's bogus findings may have led to 20 years of useless CIA and military research into psychics, they did prove one useful thing the importance of good experimental design. While the Targ Puthoff and Marx Kamen experiments had totally different findings, they did have one surprising thing in common. In both cases, test subjects left completely convinced that they were psychic. And while I'd love to talk about the fascinating psychological phenomenon that explains why, that would make this video too long, inviting punishment from our capricious czar, the YouTube algorithm. That's why I took that and everything we cut for time and put it in an extended version available exclusively on Nebula, the creator-owned streaming site that's also home to two HI originals, three Wendover originals, extended cuts of regular videos, and ad-free versions of everything. Of course, with the Curiosity Stream Nebula bundle, you'll also get access to Curiosity Stream, the fantastic documentary streaming service with thousands of top titles, including their great original about a different kind of psychedelic journey, the Woodstock Bus. You can get access to both and help support all these independent creators for just $14.79 for the whole year at current sale pricing by going to curiositystream.com/hai.